I'm Jack Kennedy, and we're here to bring you the latest in MMA. My name's Hunter Boss, and what the boss says goes. What is up, everyone? My name is Keelan McNamara, and you already know what time it is. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MMA Island Podcast. I am Jack Kennedy alongside Kayla McNamara and Hunter Boss. And today we have joining us a very special guest. He is the matchmaker and promoter of Cage Titans, Mike Pulver. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Uh, you guys are doing big things, and it's, uh, it's nice to be a part of it. Oh, of course. Well, first thing I wanted to kind of ask you is just what is it like to obviously work for and with a company like cage Titans and just what do you like the most about that organization? Ah, <laughs> man, that's kind of a funny question. Um, I work, I'm trying to think like, the, it's kind of a weird question because I actually started cage Titans, So oh, I don't really? technically work for anybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> I work he for myself. Like, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so I love working with myself. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, listen, uh, just kind of fill you in, you know, I started Cage Titans 12, 13 years ago. I was a fighter and I thought there was a lot of shit bag promoters out there. I use that term. I don't, I don't hide it. I think there was a lot of shitty promoters in this business. I think, um, you know, promoters didn't do right by fighters. And when I was fighting, I just said, you know what, my background's in marketing and sales. Uh, I think I can do this better. And that was kind of the birth of Cage Titans. Um, we had a venue. I, I was an operations manager at a venue. Uh, Lombardo's in Randolph, Mass. And we brought another promoter in that I fought for. And I kind of knew he was scummy. Um, he ended up bouncing a check to us yeah. uh, as the venue. He didn't pay a couple fighters. So, like, we were a wedding facility as well. So, like, the event was Friday. And Saturday, we come in for our day full of weddings. And we got fighters at the door looking for paychecks. And we're like, listen, we just rented them the venue. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Long story short, the owners of the company, of the venue, we're like, Mike, you fight, your background's marketing and sales. Why don't we do it without that guy and, 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 and start another fight? We had a great time. It was a great event. And, uh, you know, again, that was Cage Titans' birth back in uh, 2010. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. You know, just kind of following up a little bit. We've had Cage Titan fighters on in the past, and they always talk about how great Cage Titans has treated them. And even opponents, like, who are from Massachusetts talk about how great they're treated. Tell me, what makes uh, Cage Titan such like a welcoming community for everyone? Um, I just think every everything I do is like, how would I want to be treated when I fought? And, mm. and, and and that really resonates with the fighters. Like, And not only that, like though a lot of fighters nowadays forget that I was in their shoes, Like, I know what it's like to train, take time off from work, take time off from your family to train for that one night of a fight. Like you're, you, you know, you've been dreaming about this for an eight-week camp or whatever it is. So I've been in their shoes. Um, I just think that I just treat them like I would want to be treated when I was a fighter. Um, and, and not only that, I see what a lot of promotions do, um, with out of state fighters, you know, um, if you're a part of cage signs, I don't care what your zip code you live at is you're a part of the, the, the show, like just as important as the A side guy, which other promotions will say, um, the hometown guy who sells all the tickets and packs the venue, like the the opponent that he's fighting that maybe no one knows he has a story to tell he has a reason why he's there and and i just feel that you know that's missed on a lot of promotions it, it's like all right here here's the hometown hero uh come see him fight well who's he fighting well you don't care about the guy he's fighting like we, you don't need to hear about that and, and and i just think since we've been flying guys in for the last six seven years as we progressed um i think everybody deserves a story and 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 I'm a firm believer if 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 you give one side of the, the fight card attention, it's equal. Um, now I have Nick that helps with social media. But back when I was doing it all, it was I had my spreadsheet and it was like fighter A gets a post, B, C, D, all the way down the list. And be, until I got to the bottom list, I'd go right back to the top and everybody gets two posts. Now the, back to the top and everybody gets three just to keep it fair. And um, I think that's what resonates with people. And I think what makes our crowds a little different. Um, because they're invested. Uh, they know it's not just, um, you know, Pat Gilbride's doing our podcast later on tonight, so I'll use him. It's not mm -hmm. just Pat Gilbride's party with a bunch of his friends. Like, they know about his opponent, 
Chris Rooney, who is a multiple Vermont state champion and promotions up there. And, you know, he was, you know, they know his record. They, they know what he's about and they know why this could be a challenge for Pat. So they're, they're even more hungry um, and invested in those fights. So uh, long winded, but that's my, that's my answer. It's a brilliant answer, Mike. Uh, we really appreciate you elaborating on it. My question for you, Mike, is you said that whenever whenever you were a fighter, you wanted to do things differently because you had the misfortune of working for some really crappy promoters. My question for you is, as the boss man, as the man in the hot seat now yourself, is it everything that you thought it would be? How's the experience been of running the show as opposed to being a part of it? Man, uh, it's a lot harder than than I, you know, uh, I'd ever imagined, you know, because I want to make everybody happy. I want to please everybody. And and now in year 13, that's the hardest thing right now is, and, and I struggle with this. It's, it's, you kind of hit a nerve with that question because it definitely totally like, apologize. no, no, it's a good yeah. one. But like, you know, just answering my phone calls, like, you know, these guys message me and they're like, oh, do I got to fight? Do I got to fight? And it's like, oh, I don't got anybody for you. And I just dread that phone call or that text message. I cringe when my phone rings now. Um, I have to just put my phone on on a shelf and just not touch it for hours at a time. Um, and that's probably the the hardest thing is it, 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 that I didn't realize I'd be getting myself like is I have a lot of people's lives and livelihood and wit, you know dreams and aspirations in my hands and and I can't always fulfill everybody's. Um, back earlier days, I would I would want to do everything for everybody, and now it's like all right, cool, like. I didn't have a fight for you, but I dread having to make that phone call and be like, Hey, I don't have somebody for you. So that's probably, you know, you know, my hardest thing is, is not putting the show on. It's kind of letting people down when I don't have um, a spot for everybody. Um, I I went through a phase last year when we got back from COVID. I think we did 11 shows in like uh, 13 months because I was just putting show after show after show after show because I had so many guys that wanted to fight. And, and now going into 2023, like I'm going to try to settle back down a little bit. Um, but that's probably the biggest thing. And then also seeing guys, it, it, you know, I always make it a point to go and see the guy who came up short in his fight. Um, and, you know, everybody's going to be cheering for the guy who won and they're going to be going into the locker room and, and patting him on the back. I always try to make it a point to go to the guy who lost, um, though that is tough to see because their hopes and dreams, you know, came crashing down. Um, I think it's important because um, just goes back to what I said earlier, like everybody's a part of the show. And, and usually the question is, did you have a good time? And you know, would you do it again? And, and a lot of people look at me kind of funny when I ask them that. And uh, one fighter famously looked at me. He was like, I effing lost. What do you think? And I was like, well, did you have a good experience? Like there's going to be one winner and one loser every time you guys walk to the cage. Did you have a good experience? Were you treated fairly? Would you want to do this again? Does this motivate you? Things like that. That's all I, I care about. I don't care if you won or lost. Uh, so, yeah, that's 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 another part of the downside of the you know the job um, is it, kind of talking to those guys who who had you know came up short. Yeah, that's a lot of responsibility. That's that's really tough. Um, I was thinking more you know along the lines of like a positive note. You obviously fought in MMA. What's your favorite thing about the sport? And then how did you just get into MMA itself? Yeah. So um, my, my favorite thing is the competition. I mean, I played sports growing up. I was a hockey player, um, you know, since a small age. And um, for for workouts, I just was never the type of guy who lifted weights. And I was never a guy who ran on a treadmill. I always played sports. So after high school, um, you know, I went through a phase where, I stopped playing sports and and I ballooned up though. I'm a little chubby again now, but uh, when I started my MMA journey, actually I was about 250 pounds and I fought at 145. So, you know, the story goes, I was, I was a regional sales manager, director marketing for a company. And um, I got a severance package as we sold the company and I bought a heavy bag, a speed bag and an elliptical. And I started working out on my own in the basement and I lost 20, 30 pounds. Then I, I researched the gym, went to the gym and started training MMA um, as a whole. And, 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 and that's kind of it. So I was just never run on the treadmill, uh, lift weight kind of guy. So after sports, you know, um, I got really big and then I started training and my fights were at 45 and 55. Um, now I'm back up to 200, but hey, who's counting? 
<laughs> well, de definitely not me. All right, I'm not counting <laughs> nothing. But, uh, I just wanted to know, um, what do you think is more difficult, and which do you think is more fun, promoting or matchmaking? Oh man, definitely promoting mm. is more fun. Matchmaking just. It's so tough. You know, it, it's so difficult. You know, promoting is is easier. Like I, I design all our posters, our graphics, everything comes from me. Um, you know, so I, I do enjoy sitting down at the computer and, and coming up with a new post to design and then coming up with the matchup cards and and the quote banners and all this, all you know, all the other stuff that goes along with it. So I do enjoy promoting, um, you know, so I, I love promoting. I do enjoy matchmaking, but not nearly as much it, it, mm -hmm. it, there's it's so difficult and when you think you have it understood you don't you think a guy's going to take a fight and for some reason they don't and you're like geez you know i'll have a lot i'll have some blunt talks with coaches i'll be like just tell me what you're looking for for this matchup <laughs> because then i can just then it makes my life easier because earlier in my day i would always try to figure them out and like i knew this coach only liked these type of fights i knew this coach kind of like these type of fights this and now I'm just like, listen, just tell me, let's stop, let's just stop going around. Just tell me where your guy's at right now. Tell me what type of fight he needs for right now. And then I'll try to go from there, you know, and, and, and if he's not good, don't be afraid to tell me, Hey, he's not really good, but you know, he's been training for two years and he really needs to get in there. Cool. Give me something I can work with and, and just be upfront with me. Cause you know, we had a guy that was 59 years old that, that fought earlier in the year. And it was like, you know, don't. And, and that was the talk. It was like, Hey, I know you wanted the fight one more time. He was an 0 three guy and he started training with Joe Lozon and he really wanted to get that win. And Joe was like dead set on getting this guy a win um, or, or a fair fight um, before he was 60, before it was too late. And Joe came to me and was just like, listen, this is the type of guy. I saw a couple fighters on your cards that I would let him fight. I wouldn't let him fight anybody, but these two or three fighters, I would let him fight. Can we make it happen? And, and we ended up making it happen. But, uh, that that's matchmaking is very difficult because then you're also dealing with egos you're dealing with fighters who think that they're ready at one level and then their coaches are holding them back or their managers are holding them back um you know that, that, that then you deal with just straight out i'll be honest like guys who sell a shit ton of tickets and they're like well i'm not gonna take a tough fight i'm gonna sell a bunch of tickets and i and i don't want to take a tough fight and lose in front of my friends and family and then you got that balance of sorts that you're trying to you know um you know, work with their ego, but then also put on a show that people are going to want to see. So yeah, matchmaking, as you can tell, because I went a lot longer on it, is much, much more difficult. Oh, for definite. Mike, obviously you've done a phenomenal job uh, with Cage Titans growing it to where it is and what it is now. Whenever you look at, you know, some of the events that you host and some of the homegrown talent you've developed yourself, how does it feel looking at Cage Titans and being able to say, you know, I had a hand in this and, you know, it is where it is now because of something I was able to do or something I was able to input. How does that make you feel looking at it? Listen, man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a father of five kids. Um, but I feel like through MMA, I, I'm a, I'm a dad to hundreds of people that come through my organization. Uh, there's no better feeling, um, to see the guys achieve what they've set out for. Um, you know, Manny Bermudez comes to mind. This kid, I knew this kid when he was 14 years old. Um, I was filming guys from his gym fighting as this little kids in the corner training. And they're like, this kid's going to be a fighter one day, blah, blah, blah. And then makes his amateur debut, all his amateur fights, then his pro debut, all his pro fights with us. Um, you know, a kid like that, you know, Joe Gianetti, who's, who's coming around right now, you know, he, same thing. He was like, I remember where I was 10 years ago. I was sitting in the crowd watching a teammate fight being like, I want to be a fighter at a cage Titans event. Same thing. Amateur debut, amateur title, pro debut, all the way to the ultimate fighter pro title now champ champ. Like these guys, I, I, I see grow up Peter Barrett, um, Don Shane. It's like all these guys that you, you you've seen kind of from their first fight. That's what I love about cage Titans. You know, a lot of promotions might brag about, Oh, we got guys to the UFC that came in one stopped them. And you know, they came in and, and, and they, they beat a hometown guy and they're like, Oh, that's our guy. We got him to the UFC. It's like, you were stopped. Um, you, you know, and, and I feel like they, they want to boast about that, but, you know, what, what really, I, I do enjoy those guys. You know, TJ Brown came and fought for us. He took out Peter Barrett and then he went on to the UFC. Tony Gravely lost to Manny Bermudez in a main event for us. And he's in the UFC and Jasmine Jazz Davicious. There's, there's a bunch of them that have come through us, um, you know, but I, I, I do take a little bit of it. I enjoy all of it, but I do take some joy in seeing those kids 
that have grown up right in front of my eyes. Um, but just as important as that UFC guy achieving their green dreams, you know, every fighter on that card, because, you know, you might come to me one day and say, Hey, I, you know, I have a dream. I was a former fat kid like me. And, you know, I want to fight once. I just want to fight once to see what it's like. And that's all I want. Your dream is just as important as, and just as, you know, um, important to me to see you fulfill as the guy who does come to me and says, I'm going to be a UFC fighter one day. Um, because, you know, I'm sharing in that moment. Our fans are sharing in that moment. All of us are sharing that moment. And, and, and I think that's important to, uh, to remember when we're promoting a fight and we're putting these fights together. It's like, you know, not everybody's going to be a UFC fighter. Some guys might have dreams of one and done. Some guys might have a dreams. Chris O'Brien was a guy that was like, I'll never go pro. And it's like, well, you're an amateur title holder. Like you're one of the best in new England. You want to go pro? He's like, Nope. I achieved my dream. I my dream was to fight, lose some weight. And now I'm a title holder as an amateur. I was never going to go pro. Um, I've had other guys that say, I want to go pro and never again. I've other guys that are like, I like being a local hero. Like I like when I go to my local supermarket guys, rem rem you know, know who I am through cage Titans. And that's all I ever wanted. Um, there's guys who just fight because they want to be able to use this to catapult their personal training businesses. Uh, so everybody has a goal. The UFC ones are nice to share in, um, but I, I think they're all important. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Cage Titans has an amazing, amazing event coming up Saturday, October 29th. What are you most excited for in this event and why should people tune in? Oh, man. I mean, uh, every card is, you know, it's like, like I said, I, I, I don't know if you could hear all my kids coming out, but uh, all my kids are my favorite. All the fights are my favorite. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the main event is exciting because uh, Aaron Lacey taking on Zach D. Sabatino. And no, Zach D. Sabatino is a guy who came to us, amateur debut, all six fights with us, amateur, all his fights, he's tending to as a pro, all with us. We've seen this kid grow up. Um, you know, so k Shines fans know about him. And and he's at that cusp, at 10 and 2. Like, does he have what it takes to get to that next level uh, and maybe knock on the door of a, of a UFC bid in one or two more fights, a contender series, something to that effect. Um, and as for his opponent, Aaron Lacey, Aaron came to me probably about three, four, five months ago. And he's seven, he was seven and two at the time. and was like, listen, I want to make a push to the UFC. I'm seven and two. I've been fighting for my local regional promotion. I want to come to cage Titans and take on some of your bigger guys and, and prove I have what it takes to get to the next level. Um, he was scheduled to fight Zach before then he was scheduled to fight Peter Barrett. Um, he had a gruesome, uh, ankle injury where he actually got his ankle twisted around in training and, um, he's just recovered from it. And, just to show what kind of guy he is. It wasn't like, Hey, listen, I, I've been on the shelf for four months with a spun around uh, nasty ankle injury. Like, give me somebody easy. He's like, all right, what do we got for fights? Is Barrett available? Is DSAB available? Uh, who do you got? Because the time is now he moved away from his family, his wife and kids. He lives above the gym and this is the push for him. So that, that fight alone is two high level guys with the same kind of goals and their careers are intersecting right now. And we're going to see who has what it takes uh, to, to keep pushing to the top and, uh, that's why I'm excited about that fight. Uh, but there's a slew of others. Um, you know, I could go on for, for days and days. And as you know, I like to talk, so I could keep talking. But, you know, there's, there's just so many. Jeff Joy is an undefeated stud who's in the co-main event. Um, he was undefeated as amateur, bantamweight champ. He's undefeated 3-0 as a pro. Um, you know, he's taking on Will Sriracha Smith in, in the co-main event. And this is one of those fights at 3-0 for Jeff Joy, you know, do we have, what do you have in Jeff Joy? And Will Smith is like the ultimate measuring stick. He was, as an amateur, he was a, a title holder. He was a title contender. Um, as a pro, um, he's fought at Bellator. He's fought some high level guys. Um, and, and I think this is a great test for both guys because, um, you know, you see what you got in Jeff Joy. Can he pull it out or does he kind of go back to the, you know, drawing board and see where his goals and aspirations are, uh, jump into the next level? And as for Will, um, a big win over an undefeated guy just really puts him back on path um, to, to bigger fights down the line. So that's another great fight. Um, but yeah, man, so many good fights. Um, I, I got to give a shout out to the old guys. I'm 41 now. Uh, Greg Skin and Bones Jones is back. Uh, he was 49 years old and he was inspired by the 59 year old guy, guy John Payne, who fought for us um, earlier in the year. And he, uh, Skin and Bones Jones, Greg Jones, he had a successful debut and it was supposed to be a one and done. And it bit him and he's back this show and, and he's looking to put it on for those old guys. So, uh, you know, there's a couple of good fights for you. That's awesome. That's awesome.
couple of those are some great fights right there I, I, that, that looks entertaining i'm tuning in you yeah. know? i mean i didn't even talk about marty navis and sage felipe i mean marty's just a killer um you know he he came up short in his title bid against um billy goff who went on to the ufc so that just tells you that was his first loss of his career for marty um that tells you the level that marty's at like there's no shame in losing that type of fight you see billy go on so uh you see him taking on sage Felipe, and sage is just a beast he was such a decorated amateur he's fell short a little bit in his pro career some stumbling blocks he kind of went a little bit too fast into the deep end um but marty is is, is a beast and, and so is sage and we had them on my podcast not too long ago and and sage is like i'm gonna decapitate him. first round decapitation that was his prediction he's like and he coined the phrase i don't know if you guys have heard it but he called it tree hugging he's like there's no tree hugging in this fight and i was like tree hugging what the hell is tree hugging He's like, you know, when you just grab on and you just hug like a <laughs> hug in a tree and hoping for the takedown, he goes, no, we're coming to take each other's heads off. And uh, that that fight's going to be pumped up. Uh, got me pumped up just interviewing both of those guys. So that's another fun fight. Uh, so there's many of them. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love to hear it. Um, with fighters like Mike Brown, Joe Loison, and, and, and Kenny Florian coming out of New England, who do you think is the best mixed martial artist coming out of New England? Wow, that's a great question because I got in a debate with this with somebody on the athletic commission <laughs> Here we go. and because we were talking about this and first thought comes to mind was Joe Lozon. First thought comes to mind, Joe Lozon, like this guy, the all time bonus winner, you know, all these things. And then we were like, then as we kind of, we, we kind of narrowed it down, we're like, well, Kenny Florian, like Kenny Florian, what multiple title contender um, and multiple different weight classes and all that stuff. And we were like, boom, it has to be Kenny Florian. Um, so we kind of readjusted. And then here you go, mind blown. Tim Sylvia from oh, Maine. Oh, really? He he was tied for the title for the most amount of heavyweight defenses. He's held the heavyweight title twice. Um, he's 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 kind of the only New Englander that held the title, if I if I if I'm not mistaken. Never mind, hold it twice in in the heavyweight division. That was we were all of a sudden we were like, wow, how do we how do we not even think of him? Because he wasn't somebody that came to mind. Um, and it's funny that I bring him up today because if you looked. Brandon Schaub said something in his podcast that Tim, there you go. Keelan's got Brandon it. Brandon Schaub's about Tim Sylvia. Yeah, he <laughs> said if Tim Sylvia was around right now, he would give Naganu, he'd give uh, Cyril Gan, he'd give every heavyweight nightmares. Um, mm-hmm. So we kind of landed on Tim Sylvia. He's not the sexy pick. He's a pick that no one thinks about. Go check the stats. It's hard to argue. It is. It really is. God, I almost forgot about Tim Sylvia, but that is a great argument to have. Mike, a question for you actually about Cage Titans again. Obviously, we're coming towards the end of the year. It's been a really great year for Cage Titans as well. Might add some very, very entertaining fights. Coming into 2023, do you have any big plans, anything you were aiming to expand towards? What does 2023 look like for you in Cage Titans? Um, I think um, for us, 2023 is probably going to try to get back to like we were very methodical about like our planning of the dates. Um, you know, we used to have a formula. It was like an event and then 10 weeks, an event, 10 weeks, event, 10 weeks, event, 10 weeks, event for the whole year. We used to do five to six events a year uh, with that formula. But then, as I mentioned earlier, during COVID, there were so many fighters on the sidelines. We felt the need to just kind of kickstart MMA here in New England. So we were doing shows all the time. You know, famously, we did two shows in one day back in November because we had so many fighters that wanted the fight back in June. I'm sorry, back in February, we had so many fighters that wanted the fight. And my whole team was like, Mike, you are not doing two fights in one one day again. Uh, so we did two fights in the same month, uh, two events in the same month, February 5th and February 25th, I believe. Um, and then we had so many fighters that wanted the fight in June. We added the 4th of July weekend card. Uh, so we were just kind of like spontaneously like, all these fighters were like, we're not saying no to anybody. We'll take every fighter. You sat on the shelf long enough during COVID. We're going to put events, events, events. I think for 2023, we're going to kind of get some, some um, sense of normalcy back um, and go back to our plan skate stage of fighting and, and, and kind of what I was telling you earlier. Like, you know, when we make events, you know, we're going to do 14 to 16 fights and, and, and kind of have to cap it. And, you know, all right, you'll have to get on the next card. And, and kind of be okay with that. Cause I was not okay with that. My team always said, they're like, Mike, you know, you're just going to add another card if you get too many names. I'm like, but and I'm like, no, I'm not. And then I would do it. So I think for 2023, that's one thing we're going to kind of set our dates and, and just stick with them no matter what I'm persuaded, you know, no what other persuasion as I have. Um, we were actually trying to squeeze a fourth, uh, a Thanksgiving card in 
Like mm. that's how like we had so many guys that wanted to fight in October. We were going to do uh, November 26th, a Saturday night. And I'm fighting with my team. And I have heavyweight Brandon Battles, for instance, being like, I'll fight on that card. I'm like, you're a heavyweight. You don't care about cutting weight during Thanksgiving. Um, but, <laughs> you know, so like Joe Giannetti is like, I want to fight before the end of the year. And I'm like, I get it. But do you really think I'm going to fly guys in over for, you know, Thanksgiving, all that stuff. So I finally, for the first time, I kind of put my foot down. Um, but either way, so I would say that normalcy we'll get back to. I think we're going to shorten it to every eight weeks. So we'll probably do every other month for 2023. Uh, January 7th, you heard it here first, is our first show of the year um for 2023 there you go um and i think a big thing prior to covid was we expanded to muay thai and we started doing these fight night shows um and so we're doing mma and muay thai hybrid fights we'll get back to doing that um in 2023 and then a huge thing that everybody loved was we were doing our own cage titans grappling tournaments um so we're probably going to get back to that in 2023 a lot of people since covid has been asking when you're doing the grappling events again. We did three of them. Um, I think we're going to get back to it. And it just, we haven't got back to it because we've been so focused on jump starting the fighters' careers. Um, that's why we haven't done it yet. But for 2023, our goal is probably to do at least three or four of those grappling events because it's a nice way for guys that are looking to compete maybe down the road to get in there and compete with just submissions. Um, and, and we do submission only. You know, we don't have to worry about like, oh, if I'm on points, am I knee right? Am I doing this? You know, it's just simple. You got to tie. Yeah, we actually did no time limit, submission only. Um, you know, so it, it can prepare you for competing and in, in kind of what an MMA fight is like you're trying to finish your opponent. Um, and it was nice because we're able to now take a guy who just wants to get into grappling that might want to fight one day and get their feet wet in grappling. And then they go the next step and it's like, all right, let me try some striking arts. And they would do a Muay Thai fight with us and then eventually put it together and eventually step into the cage for us with Cage Titans, um, the MMA division. So uh, I think we'll get back to those things in 2023. That's great. That's great. Cage Titans on the way up. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so are we ready for the game now? Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, this is actually the first time we're doing this. Uh, we're going to have Michael choose one person to fight, one person to avoid, and one person that he would like to train with. Uh Hunter, do you want to know, name those three fighters? Yeah, sure. So we got um, Charles Oliveira, Islam Makachev, and Dustin Poirier. You got to fight one, avoid one, and train with one. Man. Ooh, that's a tough, tough one. So... They're, both, oh, they're all different stylistically, so it's like... Yeah, uh, man. Like So my, my initial thing is like I want to avoid the guy that's just going to get on top of me and pummel mm -hmm. the shit out of me. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of there. Oddly enough, I'm kind of like, I'm least scared of Dustin Poria, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, which is odd to say, but like, when you think of Charles Oliveira, he, Oliveira, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to mess you up on the feet. Or if you try to take him down, he's going to, he's going to strangle you. Not that Poria can't do that either, but like this guy is just, oh man. So, but then, so that, so that's kind of where I'm at. I, I, <laughs> I think I'd probably fight. I'd fight probably. Poria, um, which is crazy to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, now I'm on Malkachev. Like, I, 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 I know the hype, and I get what he does, so I kind of want to avoid him. Mm. But at the same time, it's just like he might get on top of me and like beat me up. Maybe I could hit him. I don't know. Like, ah, shit. And Charles, I'd love to train with him because he, he just he's so diverse. So I guess I'll, I'll train with, I'll train with Charles. And, and and I'll uh I'll avoid Michael Chef. I mean, like everybody else in the UFC is doing anyways. I guess. <laughs> but I was almost gonna say train with him and avoid Charles because Charles, like, there's no way to get. I mean, there's no way of beating Charles. I I, I don't see a road to victory. Any, not that I have a road to victory with Dustin Poirier either. But, <laughs> you know, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, I, I live near an airport uh, down here. I live in Plymouth as well, and we have like a small little runway here. Mm. Get a helicopter yeah. flying. <laughs> Don't worry about it. That's great. That's great. Those are that's a great answer, by the way. I don't think you can go wrong with any of those. Well, I need to hear your answers. You guys, you get okay. part of this panel. Okay, what yeah, do you got? Yeah. Hunter, you ask me. You go first. All right. Well, I would definitely avoid Islam Makachev at all means possible. All right. I, I don't know shit about wrestling and I never have. <laughs> so I'm avoiding I'm avoiding Islam. I think I'll I'll fight Poirier as well, just because I feel like I you get a striker's chance when you're fighting Poirier. You know, you get that that chance to maybe land that one punch, that lucky punch. 
but with Oliveira, there's there's no winning. You know, <laughs> there's yeah. there's there's a you could try on the feet if you want, and if you hurt him, you're going to be in trouble if you get to the ground. Either way, you, you're in trouble when you're fighting Charles Oliveira. So yeah. I'll definitely train with him. I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm not original, Mike. I'm, I'm sorry. Right. I'm going to do the whole thing. <laughs> Come on, Keelan. You were you were you were you were uh, giving me the the look when I was saying my stuff. Yeah, I bet you're taking the same as me. <laughs> I'm not, I'm actually not Mike, and I'm Ooh. gonna tell you why. I got oh. I got a crazy Irish national identity to uphold here, so I kind of gotta go a little bit mental. I'm gonna <laughs> train with Islam Makachev just to become Super Saiyan wrestling, basically, and be <laughs> unstoppable <laughs> against anyone. I'm gonna fight uh, Charles, and the only reason I'm gonna fight Charles is because I have a puncher's chance in the first round. He always gets knocked down. I'm basically going to get on my knees and pray to the Lord Jesus that that's enough to stop him. Because <laughs> if not, I know I'm dead in the second round. I'll just lie down and let him tap me out. I'm okay <laughs> with that. Tap, nap, or snap. I'm I'm at peace with that. And then I'm going to avoid Dustin. And I'm going to avoid Dustin because he, his boxing will piece me up. You know, everybody thought Connor would outbox him in the second and third fights. And Dustin did him some really heavy damage. And this is a guy who finished Justin Gaethje as well. Anything that can finish Justin Gaethje is something I don't want to be in there with or on the wrong side of. So I'm going to avoid Dustin Poirier. I'm going to fight Charles Oliveira and pray I land something on him and get a 10 <laughs> round. And I'm going to train with Islam Makachev just to try and become a god at wrestling. Ah, that's solid. It's funny. I did think of that with Charles. I'm like, oh, maybe I can clip him. But uh, yeah, then he just seems to get more mad, and he exactly. might cut some elbows. And, and and let's be real, to be as good as like Makhlchev or like Khabib in wrestling, you can train with them all you want. You're never gonna get that good. So exactly, yeah, that's. A good I, I feel like you just wasted that. I've I've basically just uh, condemned myself to death by Charles <laughs> Oliveira in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, there you go. What about you, Jack? Uh, I feel like fighting Islam Makachev would just be like a version of hell with him just taking you down and just beating you for however Basically long. Basically, the Bobby Green fight. It wouldn't last very long. It would be terrible. Uh, I mean, I would probably go the same as you guys, but I'll you know what? I'll make it interesting. I'll say I'll fight Islam. I'll train with Charles and avoid Dustin just to mix it up. Um, I have no reason for the Makachev fight other than I just want to be different, mix it up a little bit. Um. Training with Oliveira, he's he's you know not the official champ, but he's the champ. He's the yeah. best at one fifty five, no doubt about it. I mean, after the Gaethje fight, but I really believe that I think Charles Oliveira is going to be Islam. Uh, I think it's going to be it's a very close fight. It's almost fifty fifty, but just the resiliency of of Charles Oliveira is crazy. He gets dropped in every single one of his fights. He comes back in every single one of them. Like that's inspiring, if if nothing else. Plus, not to mention the best active and all the st- statistically the all time submission leader in the UFC, which is insane as well. So grappling wise, that'd be amazing train training, um, avoiding Dustin Poirier. Just, I mean, you could avoid any, any of these guys, Dustin Poirier, like Keelan said, he, he hits you. You're probably going down. Talk about resiliency. Another guy that's just fought from the depths in his career all the way back up. I mean, I, any one of us would just get mauled by any of these guys, but uh, I, I, I'm not I ashamed to say it. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, it's <laughs> Poirier, I want all the smoke. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny, you, you know. You, I almost, I almost was gonna start thinking. I was almost gonna change to go to Charles, but here, here's the difference. Like Dustin's gonna piece you up with his hands. Charles might knee you in the face. He might kick yeah. you in the head. He might elbow you. Like, because as you were like, oh, I'll let him submit me. I think Keelan, you were like, ah, oh, I might just like lay there and let him submit me. And it's like. Yeah, he's probably gonna he he'd submit you. You you hope he submits you. Yeah. Because if not, like Dustin, I'm gonna worry about him running across the cage one two hitting. He's gonna hit like a truck, and I'm gonna go out. But Charles probably is gonna hit me with like nine shots. Seven out of the nine, I'm not gonna see. I'm gonna get split open, and I'm I'm taking a nap. And you know that yeah, man. I, I, you almost you guys almost had me change my mind, but I, I I'm sticking. I'm sticking. <laughs> yeah, but Mike, nose. the problem with Dustin is Dustin's got that Mickey Ward South paw to the kidney. I ain't trying to suffer internal damage either. <laughs> yeah, but you know they look at how many people get knocked down by a kidney shot, and then three, you know, two minutes later they're perfectly fine. So I, I'd suck that up and be like, ah, whatever. It's gonna suck when it happens, but at the end of the day, it's like. You get your brains rattled by some of those. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I like this game. I, uh, I'm, I'm interested. Are you going to stick with this concept with the same weight division, or are you guys going to expand? Oh, uh, we'll expand. We're going all, all weight divisions through uh, 
through through well, different. Do stuff. you want Nganu or something? What do you want? <laughs> I mean, I, do you want Mike? <laughs> I've seen Nganu in person, and no, I did not want any Nganu. <laughs> um, though there an argument can be made that um, I know when I was coming up through training that the the bigger they are, the less skilled they are. Mm. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard that, but you know the less. Again, this is just like a broad stroke, but mm. like you know, you get. And and if you think about it, people might hate me for saying this, and I'm not talking about any local heavyweights or any of my fighters might think I'm talking about them. But like, you know, if you think like a Derek Lewis, like he's yeah. just a big guy who hits like a truck. Like, is he more skilled than any of those three guys we talked about? Probably not. Uh, you know, Tui, who's in the top ten. Like, yeah. if you shrunk him down to a 55 size body, would he have those skills? You know, um, the lighter weights seem to be more. I, mean, I'm, I shouldn't have said not skilled, but like. You know, more variety of skills. You, you know, you, when you talk about Nuganu, he's a huge heavy hitter. Um, but you know, like think about Charles. He's a he's a skillman in all those all those areas. Um, I don't know any heavyweight that's you know, John Jones. He's not heavyweight yet. But do you, you guys know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. We're picking up what you're putting down. Yeah. Have you heard Absolutely. that before? Any? Yeah, yeah. Heard that? Probably agree with it. Right? Yeah. I mean, if they, they can be more reliant on their power and their striking, so they don't have to train nearly as hard, I believe. But it doesn't mean I don't think they do. I think they I all mean, train all, everywhere they can. Yeah, and the other thing with bigger fighters as well, Mike, is that whenever you carry more muscle mass, you have less of a gas tank, so you're inherently more reliant on the power you carry. If you look at Charles Oliveira, mm -hmm. that guy is nearly like maybe 2% body fat at mm -hmm. most. And he's just naturally got such ridiculous stamina that he can afford to be more varied in the weapons that he has. Whereas if you look at someone like Derek Lewis, who probably cuts a little to make 265, he doesn't have the energy, you know, and don't get me wrong, I'm not hit. I love Derek Lewis, I really yeah, do. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, he doesn't have the gas tank to, you know, play jiu-jitsu on the ground. He has to rely on his hands, aside from the fact that I think he was a Golden Gloves champion as well. You know, these big guys, they're, they're somewhat limited in what they can do unless they are so refined from the beginning that they are able to be that very... Like, if you look at... Take Cyril Gann, for example. Cyril Gann is the new generation of MMA heavyweight. Where he's come in, he's naturally... You know, he's built like a boss, obviously, but he's very refined in his approach. And that's why he's so good at being so varied because he's gotten so early and because he's part of the new generation that's refined and taught to be multifaceted. Now, Francis Ngannou's a freak case because I actually, I'm very fortunate I had the chance to talk to Eric Nixick once a about Ngannou and I said to him how in Jesus' name can this guy wrestle now and he said you know he's always had the power and we basically just adapted it to the wrestling game so the point that you're making is absolutely varied and or it's absolutely correct and I agree with you it's just I think the more we get into MMA becoming a mainstream sport we might see more heavyweights that are better at the overall game but for guys like Derek Lewis it's because they've been here since yeah. the beginning well you know you bring up some great points too like in, in imagine as we grow in MMA, guys who are naturally, you know, 6'5", 265 pounds, they don't go towards football or basketball or some of these other sports that are that are more geared towards the bigger guys that have a career. So now you could actually have an equal career in MMA and they make mm -hmm. that jump over. Um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see, like, you know, LeBron James, what is he? I don't even know, how, but like, like imagine him coming over to MMA back then before deciding to go into to the NBA, like where his skill level, the athleticism he has and all that stuff. You know, you, you mentioned MMA. And I think when I said at the beginning of the show, like I trained in MMA, I didn't come from a jujitsu background, a wrestling background, any type of striking background. When I got involved, I just trained all facets of MMA. Um, that's something that you're going to see as the sport evolves too. Like you, you mentioned Cyril, not like he's just trained it all. Um, you know, what's your style? Well, I just train everything that, that you know, and, and there's no specifics. Um, as you had earlier days, you know, if you broke it down to the three, you had a striker, a grappler, uh, uh, or a wrestler. And it was like, you had to be good at, if you were really good at one, you could be successful. Then it was like, ah, oh, you can be good at two out of the three. Now it's like, size Michael Chef and be even something like that. But like, you know, you, you want to have all three facets in, in combined in that MMA. So, um, yeah, man, it's 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 great. It's it's funny. We talk about Boston. Uh, I think his name was Stephen Neal, um, and how they translate to different sports. And 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 Stephen Neal was a lineman 
but he was a wrestler. Um, and I think in like the off season, he would train like MMA to get with his hands and hand positions and stuff like that. Um, if we, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying, imagine some of these athletic people that went down the path of other sports. If they now just got involved from an earlier age into the mixed martial arts world, um, where their sport's going to go from 20 years from now. Well, look at Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar was on the practice squad for the Minnesota Vikings. before. Yeah. I know he was a collegiate wrestler, but if Brock Lesnar had gotten into MMA now, the guy would be terrifying because he had such athletic skill. And Brock Lesnar is like six foot five, six foot six, 200 and whatever yeah. amount of pounds yeah. he is. Could you imagine someone like Brock Lesnar in today's MMA? I mean, he would be, he would just run through everybody if he was coming in now. Right. We uh, digress. I don't know how much our time limit is, but I could talk to MMA. <laughs> I could talk to MMA all day. Oh, of um, I love it, you know, and I'm sure you guys love it. That's why you have this podcast. Um, so I won't take up too much of your time because then I want you to have me back mm-hmm. and we can shoot the shit some more. Hey, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much for joining us today. As always, everyone, make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. You can listen to us everywhere, literally everywhere, including iTunes and Spotify. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at MMA.Island.Pod. And check out Cage Titans on Instagram. Make sure to tune in Saturday, October 29th. And Mike, thank you so much again for joining us today.